The year is 1892. Alice Island opens for the first time to receive its immigrants. Pledge of Allegiance is set for the first time in unison in all public schools. Chicago opens its elevated train system called the L. And Boston Camera Manufacturing revolutionizes the world of photography by introduction of its bullseye camera. Eastman, being a smart businessman, recognizes how important that camera might become and recognizes that it may become a threat to his own line of cameras. So in 1895, Eastman purchases Boston Camera Manufacturing, therefore acquiring all the patents to the bullseye camera. The rest is history. Boston bullseye camera revolutionizes the way the cameras work and look going forward for another 60 years or so. It combines three very interesting features that have not been seen before. It's little red window in the back of the camera that we all know and love today that was introduced by Boston Camera. The fact that the reels of film were loaded in the front of the plane of focus, therefore reducing the, the size of the camera by about one third, or slightly maybe more. And one of the most important things, without which that window would not even exist, was the film itself was sandwiched with a paper backing. Samuel Turner, the founder of Boston Camera Manufacturing, applied for the patent in 1892. It was granted to him in 1895. Also in 1895, Eastman produces its copycat of Boston Bullseye Camera called the Bullet. And in August of 1895, Eastman purchases Boston Camera Manufacturing. From now on, the Bullseye becomes Kodak Bullseye and its popularity grows tremendously. In today's segment, I'll be jamming two cameras into one video. One is a Kodak Bullseye camera, specifically number two Bullseye camera. On the other hand, no pun intended, Bullseye Special 1898 model. So without further ado, let's Take a closer look at these quite interesting, historically very important cameras. After its introduction, Bullseye Camera, manufactured by Boston, was popular, but not as popular as Kodak would have made it in that later in the years. You have to realize one important thing, which is the price. Bullseye Camera cost seven dollars while any other Kodak that was manufactured at similar point of time was between 25 and 30 dollars tremendous difference another thing was that the camera itself was much smaller than a Kodak also the film could be loaded in daylight subdued light you didn't have to take the camera into the dark room and reload the film. You could just purchase cartridges, load them in, and keep on shooting. In 1898, Kodak introduces Bullseye Special. It's a higher end model camera as compared to the standard Bullseye. It features sector shutter that has to be cocked before firing. It features Bausch & Lomb rectilinear lens with apertures of f4 all the way up to f128. Besides, the camera is the same design. What significant difference is that the viewing window, the brilliant finder, is located to the side of the camera versus in the middle of it, 
as compared to the original model. Both cameras were very simple to use. You just had to cock the shutter, point the camera at the interesting subject, snap the shutter, and then advance the film until next number showed up in that little red window in the back of the camera. Kodak Bullseye and originally Boston Bullseye camera used film number 101 and that produced images three and a half by three and a half or nine by nine centimeters. It, it took 12 pictures on one roll of film. Let's go over how to open this camera, how to load the film, and then maybe load some film in it, perhaps take some pictures. Let's start with the standard model number two, bullseye. As you can see, smack down the center of the camera, there's a viewfinder, which is round, although the camera produces square photographs. Uh, I guess the just the leftover from original design introduced by uh, Boston. The key on the right hand side of the camera advances the film. Right up front you have the shutter mechanism. You simply push it one way or the other in either direction it triggers the shutter. This here is part of that uh, round viewfinder and images projected here are actually round. You have aperture settings and you have time setting uh, via these levers here. In order to open the camera there's a sliding latch on the side of it. You simply pull it out and you lift up the whole camera. You'll notice, if you watch my video on Kodak Pocket Camera, it's the same design with exception of the sliding latch being up front. Pocket Camera, sometimes it's considered to be the first one to introduce this particular design, however, it is not the fact. As mentioned, Boston Bullseye is the original, original. Let me put this aside. And let's focus on this box. Simple box finished in leather, wood versus cardboard. Inside, either printed or pressed with some kind of stamp. The name number two, Bullseye Model D, manufactured by Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. The mechanism of the camera itself is quite very simple yet very elegant, very nicely made. I just want to mention that original bullseye camera was made in two types of finish. One was leather and the other one, the other one was uh, called ebonite which is type of finish on plain wood. As you can see this is simple shutter mechanism, rotary shutter. I guess the name derives from the from the wheel that turns and just in, opens up the little passage for the light to strike the film plane. Here is a lever for time. So you pull that up and that stops the wheel from rotating all the way. And here's the lever for apertures, which moves sort of a cam and changes the opening of the aperture. The film spools go in front of the plane of focus, which in the end created the camera that's much shorter than previous cameras. and another spool, the take-up spool, goes in here. The interesting aspect of these spools is that they are hollow through. So let me open 
open this up. Now in order to take out this pull, you have to unscrew the, the key, pull the key out. And this is very similar to Kodak Pocket, but Kodak Pocket's key did not come out all the way. It actually uh, sort of stayed in its, uh, in its socket. And then the whole assembly sort of slides out, rides out on this, on this little cam. The spool on this camera is highly specialized and in order to shoot any modern film on it, there are two ways. You would either have to have a way to re-spool the film onto this spool or purchase a kit for a few dollars on eBay. It's a 3D printed kit that lets you use 120 film in one of these cameras, which is pretty cool. And this is what I'm planning on doing. But let's put this back together. Let's switch the gears and let's talk about the bullseye special. And what is there not to talk about? Kodak bullseye special, higher end model, beautifully finished and I guess Moroccan leather I would I would say same principle you open it camera slides out you'll notice that it's slightly different slightly more advanced so to speak uh, the previous one is a Toyota and this is a Lexus same box design, however, it seems a little bit longer for some reason, just a bit. And I guess this is to accommodate that bigger and better lens. Inside, you have the name of the camera, number two bullseye special model of 1898. Bullseye special was about twice as expensive as the Kodak Bullseye number no. 2 standard model. This one was about $15 upon its introduction versus $8 of, for the Kodak standard Bullseye. The shutter is part of the lens assembly now. This is a Bausch & Lomb rectiliner lens with aperture of f4 to f128 changed by moving this little pointer to cock the shutter you actually have to move this little lever and that cocks the the shutter mechanism and to fire it you just press the button simple as that up on top you have a little lever that changes between the standard instantaneous time, which is between 1 30th and 1 50th of a second, the bulb mode, and the T time. The Brilliant Finder, which is located in this nicely made wood box sort of contraption. The problem with this one was when I got it, it was super dirty. There was a lot of stuff inside. Uh, particles from the mirror itself and dust got in there somehow so I had to make it uh, come out but I was able to open up the the mirror box and clean it up with some um, with some alcohol so it's nice and clear right now so what is there left to do but load some film and take it out and take some pictures I think that if I loaded 120 film using these special 3D printed 21st century spools, I can get some decent results. And I'm thinking I'll use the bullseye special to do that for its um, better flexibility to adjust the aperture. The problem is that 120 film is at about an inch and a quarter narrower than original film. You can make a mask 
and you can stick it on to the film gate to reduce the size and I will create sort of rectangular photos which would be uh, six by nine centimeters two and a quarter by three and a half however I'm not gonna bother with that I'll just load the film and I'll leave it all open so that the image will be exposed on the entire frame hopefully that will yield some interesting results I came to the Grove in Glenview, Illinois behind me is a beautiful Canicut house built in mid 1800s and this would be my second attempt to shoot with this camera the first attempt failed because the window, the red window in the back, let so much light in that it actually exposed the film through the paper and it fogged it completely. It was, it was nothing, no images were um, usable. So I'm going to try again. I'm going to walk around the place. There's many interesting um, features on this property and I'll try to get some images and hopefully this time I put a little black piece of uh, cardboard in the back of the camera to uh, prevent the light from expo overexposing through the paper backing. Hopefully that will help. We'll see how it goes. So I'm going to go ahead, mount the camera and go with it.